How are y'all doing tonight? I am a Pastor LaVon. I'm a more conversational teacher than others. Um, I really like, like Pastor Joey. I like feedback. I like it when we laugh together. I like it when we say amen together. Probably because I'm a worship leader, and I like it when people come and join us when we do stuff. So I'm, I, I'm going to ask you to stay, stay with me tonight. I'm going to talk about something really important in our lives, and it's like a next step in your spiritual walk. And it's what I commonly refer to as my place of power, a place of power in your life. Um, a place of power in your life is a place where you're at the right place in the right time kind of thing, but it's not just a moment-by-moment -moment thing. It's a continual thing. So we're going to start with one of my favorite scriptures, Jeremiah, 20, Jeremiah 29, 11. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now, when you look at that and you're 55, like I am, you're thinking a future and a hope. Well, my future, if I live to be 100, it's just a few more years, you know. But the future and a hope is not, doesn't look like a lot when you're 55. But God didn't say you have to be 16 to believe the scripture, did he? He said, I'm going to give you a future and I'm going to give you a hope. Doesn't matter how old you are. Doesn't matter. So I just want to encourage you. Whether you're 16 or younger, or whether you're 55 like me and older, God still has something that he has for you to do in the kingdom of God. And for us, um, you know, I'm at the age where I'm thinking about legacy. And for those of us that, you know, if you get older, the only alternative is dying to getting older. I don't want to die. So I'm going to get older, right? We're all going to be 55 one day unless we, Jesus comes back or we pass. So the thing is, is that you're going to leave a legacy of something. You're, we're going to leave a legacy of something in our lives. And so we want to leave, leave a legacy of serving God, committed to God, our children better than we are, right? Right. Okay. All right. Well, I do love that it says that it doesn't, you know, it's like for everybody. There's no qualifications either. He doesn't say, if you serve me completely, and you don't make any mistakes, then I have good for you and not evil. That's not what he says either. His plan for us is good. Now, the thing about a plan is what? If you have a plan, like I'm a planner. I have a planner, a little Aaron Condren planner. I write down everything that I'm going to do that week. But you know what happens sometimes? It doesn't get done because I don't apply myself some weeks to pay attention to my planner that I planned so if we don't pay attention to God's plan, we may not get the good that he has planned for us because of the choices we make, right? Right. All right. So I just that's a little foundation for what we're going to talk about. Um, and it's actually quite a bit of foundation, so you'll have to forgive me there. But he does have jobs, and he has things in this world that he wants us to do. We're all the church, right? We're, Victory Church is a section, a part of the church of Christ, the church of God worldwide. We do our part, right? Right? Inside Victory Church, we do our part. I do my part. You do your part. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 12, 19 through 24. It says, But I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from being blown up into self-importance. So he's talking to the church here. All right. For no matter how significant you are, it's only because of what you are a part of. The pastor who preaches here, Pastor David, every Sunday or most Sundays, most Wednesdays, he is a part of the body of Christ. The person who is a helper in the nursery and is there every week at 930, every week at 930, she's praying for babies and loving on babies and changing baby poopy diapers and, you know, doing the, letting a mother stay in here and hear the word of God. That woman is doing her part or man in the kingdom of God. And it says here that I want you to think, I also want you to think about how this keeps your significance from getting blown up because into self-importance, into self-importance. So for one 
Oh, well, I'll just keep going because I think it explains it. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand wouldn't be a body but a monster, wouldn't it? Right? Have y'all seen those ears that they grow in the Petri dishes on TV sometimes? They're kind of odd looking because they just aren't attached to anything, right? So they look strange. But what we have, back to the scripture, is one body with many parts, each its proper size and in its proper place. No part is, is important on its own. If Pastor David's up here preaching, but no one's doing children's ministry or the nursery, there's going to be a lot of crying babies in here and kids fussing. And it's, they're going to have to turn the mic up real loud. And it's just going to f- seem a little chaotic. Because you know what? Kids don't like to sit and listen. They like to go in there and listen on their level. They like to be hands-on, their little crafts they do, and then they play, and then they listen and talk. I mean, they change things that back there every five minutes, what they do, because they want to keep their attention, and they want to teach them about God, and they don't want them to be bored with God. Okay, so Pastor David, even though he's as important as he is, he's in the body of Christ here at Victory, but so is that children's worker back there doing what they're doing for the body of Christ. And so is this worship person up here. So is the person who runs the words back there. You never see her, but you wouldn't be able to sing if she wasn't there because you wouldn't know the words, right? Each part is important. Each part. So no part is more important on its own. Can you imagine the eye telling the hand, get lost, I don't need you, on your body? No, we can't. Or the head telling the foot, you're fired, your job, has been, your job has been phased out. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, in practice, it works the other way. The lower the part, the more basic and therefore necessary. You can live without an eye, for instance, but not without a stomach. When it's a part of your own body you are concerned with, it makes no difference whether the part is visible or clothed, higher or lower. You give it dignity and honor just as it is without comparisons. If anything, you have more concern for the lower parts than the higher. If you had to choose, wouldn't you prefer good digestion to a full head of hair? Some of, most of us would have them. <laughs> the thing is, is that it's all that when your stomach hurts, Oh, man, when your stomach really hurts, I mean, you just want to go lay down and get kept abysmal. And, but when your foot hurts, you kind of like shake it off and you kick on it. And you're like, okay, I know that you're hurting, but there's got to be position here where it's not going to hurt. Right? And that's an outward thing. Well, this is an inward thing. And it's, the, it's more important than the foot. And we give it more attention, you know, than the foot. So, it's, so hidden things are important. Every weekend, every Wednesday, behind the scenes, Things behind the scenes of church, things happen. The building gets cleaned. Maintenance happens. We type up things. We prepare songs. There's a lot of hidden stuff that gets, gets things happening. There's a lot of movement happening so y'all can come in and worship God and forget about what's been going on last week and what you got to do next week. But we can take 30, 45 minutes to an hour and focus on God, on what he's doing. And it's because of those hidden parts. So all the parts are important. Outside parts, hidden parts, they're all important. We are all called, I would say even destined, to serve in the body of Christ, to have a place, a place where we do something in the body of Christ, even here at Victory. And it's important for us all to understand that. I really believe it's a next level step for believers. Um, When I was in high school, I made three commitments to Christ. And it's it's not silly. I mean, I really meant it every time I prayed, but I would try to get involved and I would be, you're too young. You don't sing good enough. You've not, you're not one of the families of the church kind of thing. And that's okay. That was their, their protocol. That's cool. Well, then I got saved at a little bitty church. It was a little bitty Baptist church and, but they had a ton of college kids there. And I was a college kid. Of course, Don went there, so that's why I went to church. Because he told me he wasn't going to date me because I wasn't saved, which I thought was totally unfair. But he was taking a stand. And you know what? That's what you're supposed to do, take a stand. So the thing is, is that I got saved there. And you know what? I wasn't saved three days, and they called me to play piano. I was still playing piano in piano bars in Lubbock. 
So they called, and I was like, hey, well, I'm still doing this because this is, I make some money this way, you know. If they pay, they tip really good, you know, but, and they were like, that's okay, we just need a piano play this weekend. So I came and played, and pretty soon the piano bar kind of went away because you know what? It wasn't near as much fun, and it wasn't near as awesome as playing in church. I got hooked in immediately. I mean, immediately I got hooked in to serving God and serving people, you know, and it made such a huge difference. And the fourth time was the charm for me because I got pulled in. I got pulled in to serve. It made me go to church. It made me get out of bed before 12, you know. Um, it, it made me walk right when I started listening to the word more and we were listening to the word, we were doing worship and I was like, Wow, I'm singing these words to the, I like words to songs. I really focus on the words. I surrender all. Yeah. I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender. I don't know about that one. You know, I wouldn't sing songs because I wasn't quite sure that I was ready to be there yet, but I would play them. But I just wouldn't sing them because words are important. Words are important. And uh, so the thing is, is that I I got in and I, I stuck. I stuck and I stayed. I've never... Miss church except for a few times having babies and having surgery. But church, being an active member of a church, being an active participating member, serving God through serving people is where it's at. It's it's the next step. It's a place of power for you. It's a place um, where you can get fulfilled. Sometimes we feel empty or we feel like something's stirring on the inside of us or something's not you know, we come to church, and we're reading our Bible, and we're praying every day, and all that stuff, but yet it's like, eh, there's still something missing. I can tell you the missing link is serving. The missing link is serving people and serving God. So when we were youth pastors, Don and I were youth pastors, and I was a little youth pastorette, I, um, I always had girls at my house. We had so many girls that would spend the night. My poor kids, they didn't, they had so many Babysitters, they just called them all Murray. Rosemary was the main one, and Joshua called her Murray. So all of our babysitters were Murray. When girls would come over, they were all Murray. Murray, Murray, Murray. So, you know, they just got confused because we always had young, young women and girls over at our house. I was always talking to them. They were always talking to me. And we had open-door policy at our home. You know, we were just, we were there for them. And it was a great time in our life. And, and that's a little thing of sowing seed. You know, I was serving where I could. I was staying at home with my kids. I couldn't, and I, we had one car, so I couldn't go out and do something, but I was serving where I could. Those girls could come to my house on the afternoon after school, and we would have a little Bible study, talk about things. It's important. I know y'all did the same thing. Y'all had a very much of an open door policy when y'all were youth pastors, because kids want to talk. All you have to do is give them some time, and they will tell you everything, <laughs> sometimes more than you want to know. But, but the thing is, is that I was serving in a little place, and after I had um, Amanda, I started singing again a little bit and, and um, you know, being involved more in worship at that church where we were at there. And then when I was like six months pregnant with Joshua, I'd been serving faithfully in a couple of areas. They said, do you want to lead worship? Because our worship leader was... I don't know how old he was. I think he was like 80 years old then. He just died a few years ago, but he was very, he was very old, but he was very tired of leading worship. <laughs> he says, I think I just want to go sit down and do finances. He did finances in the church. So I was like, okay, I think I can do that, but I'm six months pregnant. So, you know, you learn to play piano like this when you're pregnant. So, but, you know, that was where I, I learned a lot about serving and being a leader, not just serving, but I was a leader now. And so I had spent all those 10 years serving those girls, you know, serving my kids, raising my children, doing what I knew to do for God. And then God saw the faithfulness in the small things. And then when he sees faithfulness in your life in small things, not just in ministry, but in your family, in your job, when you're faithful, God sees it all. Then he promotes you because promotion comes from God. So this is the next level step for some of us tonight. It's a next level step. It's the thing that we need to do to close out. I mean, you know, when you're a farmer, it's called hoeing out the row. 
There's nothing worse than at the end of a row when you're hoeing cotton, because at the end of the row is where all the careless weeds are. We call them careless. I don't know what everybody else calls them, but they grow like this high, and their roots grow just about that down, far down. <laughs> They're awful. And so when you and my dad would say, "You got to hoe out that row and get all those weeds." So you're, I mean, the end of the row was almost as long as the whole row that you just did. So, but what, what serving God, what getting into this, what really getting involved is, is you're hoeing out the row. You're telling God, man, I am here. I'm going to stay. I'm going to get, I'm going to work. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm here. I'm serving you. I'm serving your people. I need you to come through for me in some of these areas. I'm believing you. I'm standing. You're praying, standing on his word. You're doing your time, your talent, and your treasury. You're doing it all with him and asking him to, I need these things. He wants to give us these things. Sometimes he's just waiting on us to move. God moves, we move. God moves. You moved to get saved. Those of y'all that got up here tonight to receive Jesus, you moved, and God met you there. And that's the same kind of thing this is. We move. We say, we're going to go work in the coffee shop, and then God moves. It's a, it's a, it's a true, true thing. I've, I've seen it in my life over and over again. So in Second Chronicles, oh, sorry, First Chronicles. I need new glasses or contacts or something. First Chronicles 17, 9, God tells Israel that there is a place established for them. It's a place of power for them. It's a place where you meet God. It's where they would meet God. It's a place where they met God. And it's also a place where you meet God. This is a place where you give out of your gifting. A place of power for Holly, Tillery, who's saying tonight, is definitely worship. It's where she prospers. She, her soul prospers. It's where we get blessed, right? It's where she feels that she is serving God with what the gift he has given her. That's the key. That's your place of power. That is a place where you're like, I can't wait to go to church because I am helping Pastor Nathan in VK, and we are going to play some awesome games in there today. And you're the game tender or whatever they call it back there. Um, but that place of power is important for our lives because everything can be going hectic out here, but you know that you know that you know this is the place that God has for you right here. And you're serving God and you're serving people. I say it again and again. We're serving God, we're serving people, and God is watching. He's watching us in the small things. Promotion comes from God, remember? Promotion comes from God. Um, this is a place where you give out your gifting. This is a place where you receive strength. I never realized that personally till I had surgery, and I was out of church for like six weeks. And if anybody knows me, that is not normal. But when I came back, I came back at six weeks and just sat on Sunday morning. And to me, it was like heaven. <laughs> because it's the, it's the body of Christ. It's like when you, if, you, if you've ever sat out of church. I never have, but people have told me. They get mad about something or they just get busy with life during the summer. And they sit out of church. And nowadays you can watch it online, but it's definitely not the same. But you sit out of church, and you don't come in and feel the body of Christ here. When you come in, and there's corporate worship going on, and we're all serving God. And it's all, you know, you're just like, man, God's like in this place, and I can feel him, and it's amazing. Ah, you know, and you get strength from that. How many of us have had a bad Wednesday and come in here, didn't worship, listen to the word, you leave, man, you feel a lot better. At least you feel relaxed enough to go to bed now, right? So, you know, there's something about us coming together. There's something about being in church. We get strength. We get strength when we serve in the place of power that God has for us, in the place that Jesus wants us to do something. It's where we display the gifts that he has given us. It's where God displays his love and power to you and through you. I think there's nothing more awesome than going, coming in greeting I mean, coming into the front door and there's the greeters there. And I love it when Tori's there because she always makes me give her a hug. And so I always give her a hug. I'm not a big hugger, but I give people hugs if they demand it. So, so she always, but she's such a great greeter. We have great greeters. We have great people out in the parking lot. You know, they're like, welcome to church with the signs. Um, we have great coffee shop people, great children's ministry people who love kids. 
I mean, they are working in their place of power. If you're somewhere and you have a frown, you may not be in your place of power. You may need to try something else, you know. Um, but, you got, but we're here to help you find that place of power for you to get what you need on the inside. Like I said, Holly's place is worship. Dale Langhennig, his place is worship. Um, Colby, who is back there somewhere, he does graphics. All the announcements you see, Colby Meyer, his place of power is in front of a computer making graphics which I would totally go to sleep if I had to do that, right? Um, Anthony, I was thinking about Anthony today because he's laying carpet. His, I, he's fast too, man. He's like doing that little knee thing, you know, that they do. Um, I don't know. It's, I don't know what it's called, but it's cool. I was sitting there watching him. I'm like, wow, he is really good. I've never seen you lay carpet. So. But he does sound in here. He is a busy, busy guy. Let me tell you, we've just found out he is super busy. But he is here Wednesdays and Sundays doing sound, serving God, serving you, making sure it's not too loud. There's no feedback. I'm not going to scream at you. He'll turn me off if I do. So you see what I'm saying? So we all have a place. And like I said, the greeters, awesome. Ushers, ushers, amazing, amazing ushers. And um, children's ministry. I think children's ministry is the most impacting ministry in our church. You don't have a good children's ministry, you don't have a good youth ministry, and you won't have a good adult because they're our future. Those, those guys are our future. They're our future worship team, our future ushers, our future greeters. They're, they're, they're the future church. And so that's why it's so important when you teach children's ministry. Oh, my gosh, it's so important. So to get that point across, I have a great story for you. <laughs> Take Edward Kimball. Do you know who that is? Anybody? I might have found the off, awesome story. Um, I never had heard of him either, though. I'd heard of this story, but I didn't know that his name or anything. Kimball was a Sunday school teacher who not only prayed for the often rowdy boys in his class, but also sought to win each one to the Lord. If Kimball ever felt like giving up, he never talked about it. If you have ever taught a Bible class to young boys, you know that it can feel like herding cats. And really, girls aren't much different. They just like to talk rather than move around. One young man in particular didn't seem to understand what the gospel was about. So Kimball went to his shoe store where he was stocking shelves and confronted him in the stock room with the importance of a personal relationship with Jesus. That young man was Dwight L. Moody. I don't know if y'all know who Dwight L. Moody was, but he revolu- he's man, a super evangelist. I know- It says right here, um, in the stockroom on Saturday, he received Jesus, and in his lifetime, he touched two continents for God and had untold thousands come to faith in Jesus because of him. But it doesn't end there. Actually, it's where it begins, because under Moody, another man's heart was changed by God, Wilbur Chapman. Chapman became the evangelist who preached to thousands. One day, a professional ball player walked in his Um, meetings, one of his meetings, and right there, Billy Sunday was converted. Billy Sunday was another great evangelist. This is, we're talking like turn of the century, I think, um, time-wise, as far as that goes, but you'll see why. Sunday, Billy Sunday quit baseball and became part of Chapman's traveling team. Then Chapman accepted a pastor of a large church, and Billy Sunday began to do his own evangelistic crusades. Then another young man was converted during those crusades whose name was Mordecai Ham. He was a scholarly, dignified gentleman who wasn't above renting a hearse and parading it through the streets, advertising his meetings, much like our own Pastor Joey. (laughs) When Ham came to Charlotte, North Carolina, a sandy-haired, lanky young man, then in high school, vowed he would not go here and preach. But Billy Frank, as he was called by his family, he did eventually go, and Ham announced that he knew for a fact that a house of ill repute was located across the street from the local high school and that male students were skipping lunch to visit it. So when students decided they were mad and they were going to go interrupt the meetings of Mordecai Ham, Billy Frank went with them. And that night, Billy Frank went with those boys to interrupt the meeting, but he was intrigued by what he heard. Returning the next night, he responded to the invitation and was converted. Billy Frank, who is also known as Billy Graham, the evangelist who preached to more people than any other person who has ever lived, including the Apostle Paul. Now, what would have happened if Kimball would have said, Edward Kimball would have said, 
I'm not going to teach boys. I'm going to, I'm called to preach. I'm not going to teach kids. I'm called to preach or I'm called to lead worship. Who, who saw him teaching the kids? God and the boys and the boys' parents who were very happy he was teaching the kids. But if he hadn't started that, what if he hadn't started? Then where would Dwight Moody have been? I mean, it's like, it's like dominoes. It's like things have to happen. We don't know what our part is in this, but we know that we have to do what God tells us to do. When we do what God tells us to do, one day your name might be here with one, two, three, four other names who have eventually led to the next great soul winner evangelist in America or in the world. So that's why I'm saying what we do is important. Whether your security, which is really important today, coffee shop, smiling, being happy, children's ministry, everything, every piece, every part counts. I don't want to live without my stomach. Neither does the body of Christ. The body of Christ needs the stomach. So God sees that big picture. Um, he sees from here to where it ends. He saw from the beginning to the end. He knows your life from here to the end. He knows every part. He knows the giftings and the callings he's put in your life. He knows what he wants you to do to play in the part of something. So we have to do our part. If we don't do our part, it may cause somebody else not to do their part. Um, it's very, very um, humbling when you think about it like that, don't you think? Because, wow, you know, I know that we were youth pastors for a long time, and we have probably three, maybe four of our teenagers in San Antonio that are in full-time ministry. And most of them serve in church somewhere. They're raising kids. They're, do, they're doing great. They're like our spiritual grandkids now. Their babies are. But we impacted them, and that's super awesome. I mean, we do impact our natural children, yes. But other people, yeah, we need to impact other people. Um, so let's talk about that gifting that's inside of you. 2 Timothy 1, 1 um, 6 and 7. That is why I would remind you to stir up, rekindle the embers. This is the amplified version. Rekindle the embers of, fan the flame, and keep burning the gift that God has given you. And he says, it's given you with laying on of my hands and the elders at your ordination. But everybody has a gift. We have to stir it up. Sometimes it's stirring, like I said earlier, and we don't even know what it is. It's just like... I don't know what's happening. I know I need to make a decision about something or you're just unsettled. You know, it's time to make a decision. It's time to step out and do something you, maybe you've never done before or maybe you've done it before and you just got weary and well-doing. But let's, you know, we, let's step out. Listen, kingdom of God is going on and we want to be on that bandwagon, right? Right. Verse 7 says, God didn't give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of of craving and cringing and fawning fear, but he's given us a spirit of power and love and a calm, well-balanced mind, discipline, and self-control. If you're afraid of what that stirring is, don't be afraid. God's put it in you. If he's put it in you, he can bring you through it. He can teach you to do it. I mean, what, what I'm trying to say is if it's in you, he's given you the ability to do it, right? Right? You know how long? It took me a long time to learn to sing and play piano at the same time. Because I was a singer, and then I was a piano player. <laughs> and it's like, you know, too many things going on at once sometimes. But it took me about a year to practice and do it. So you can do it. If it's, it's, if it's a gifting, it's in you, you can do it. Um, I think he has a gift that he wanted just you to have. He has a gift for each one of us, and we have to find out what it is. And sometimes we fill out application for volunteer or we go talk to somebody and we do children's ministry like I did children's ministry once for two years God gave me grace and mercy during that time because I'm not called to children's ministry at all so I had to put on like I had to make a fake person to do it but it was really fun I was Laverne the hairdresser you know but that way I could act it out and then you can do anything when you're acting right um, but the thing is is that I knew I wasn't called. And sometimes you have to try two or three things. You have to just go around. Okay, well, I, I do like 
Pastor Nathan, but yeah, I'm just not into the kids. Maybe I should go look in the coffee shop and talk, do it with adults, you know. And if you're not friendly, don't be a greeter. If you're not normally a happy person, you know what I mean? I say happy. I'm, I'm kind of a somber person, a quiet person. Y'all see my, all my angry faces over here at worship sometimes. We call them angry worship faces. Don't laugh, Rebecca. She's laughing at me. But um, I wouldn't be a great greeter. I mean, I would now. When I was in my 20s, I would have been a terrible greeter. Oh, my goodness. But... If you're, if you're not a happy, outgoing person, greeting may not be your ministry, but you know what you could help with? If you really like numbers, you could do the connections desk. I mean, there's a place for you. There's a place. And God has given each of you a gift, a real gift on the inside, so you can do what you need to do. So 2 Timothy, um, we're going to go on with the verse 8. I don't know if I'm going to read the whole thing, but I'll read part of it. If you stir up this inner power, you will never be afraid to tell others about Jesus. If you stir up that gift on the inside, like it talks about in seven, 6 and 7, we're stirring up that gift, and we're going to do it. And God's not giving us a spirit of fear, so we know we can do it because he's given it to us. And as we stir up that gift, guess what happens? We get bold, and we're not afraid to tell people about Jesus anymore because we know God has given us a gift. It's a gift that he has just given us. We can do it. We're not afraid. We're not timid. We're not shy. We're not fearful. We are sharing that gift with the body of Christ, and we're sharing that gift with God. And because we're sharing our gift, we can also share Jesus. Right? Right. It's good, isn't it? And this is why we want to share the gift, because he saved us and he chose us for this holy work, not because we deserved it, but because it was his plan long before the world began to show his love and kindness to us through Christ. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who broke the power of death, showed us the way to everlasting life through trusting him. And um, the rest of it, Paul's kind of talking about how he was a missionary and chosen by God. But let's skip to verse 13. It says, hold tightly to the pattern of truth I've taught you, especially concerning the faith and love Jesus offers. Guard well the splendid God-given ability you received as a gift from the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Guard it well. It's a gift. By guarding it well doesn't mean we keep it and hide it under a bushel. No, we're going to let it shine, right? Right? No, y'all know that song? This is a lot of mine? Okay. All right, sorry, just kidding. Um, It doesn't matter if we think we can do it or we can't. That doesn't matter. It's not important. It doesn't matter if we don't think our gift is important because what's important? Every gift, right? Say every gift is important. Every gift is important. Every gift. It doesn't matter if we think it's important or not. If we think we should be doing something else but we're not gifted to to, to do it, we might just be fooling ourselves. I'm not going to be a... Huh, preacher, and I'm not going to get deep into Greek and Greek words and Hebrew words and things like that. I'm more of like a, just talking, a talker. And if I try to do that, then that's out of my wheelhouse, and I'm probably going to not be great at it. So I have to go with the gifting that God's given me. You have to go with what God's given you. What we're doing is important for the kingdom of God. Say, what I'm doing is important for the kingdom of God. It is. You might be the liver of the body of Christ. I think the liver of the body of Christ is prayers, honestly, because I think prayers filter stuff, you know. But you might be just a prayer. You may just be like, hey, I want to pray. I believe God's called me just to pray for the church. I know people like that, man. They're just strong prayers, man. They intercede for people. And we pass, you know, things on to people for prayer if, if, um, if, If I know who they are, if we know who they are, we pass them on for prayer. And like I said, you may not think you're as important as Paul, but he still told us that we have to guard it. We have to use that God-given ability. From Genesis to Joshua, God told Israel several times, he'd say, go here, and here I will meet you. Go here, here I will be with you. Go here, you will find food here. I mean, if you read through it, you can see constantly God would say, go there or there I will do. There I will do. And that's places of power. So if we figure out what our there is, then God will do. You know what I'm saying? That's like a while ago I said, we move, God moves. So we move and we go there. 
We go to the place where our gifting works. Our gifting is used. And so we go there, God moves. God meets us there. So we go there, God says, I will do. And, and believe him. Continue to believe him for things like the breakthroughs, cards that we talked about. You know, believe him for the breakthrough. This could be the thing that brings your breakthrough. This could be the thing that, that brings the answer to that one prayer you've been praying for a long time. So I'm saying just don't be afraid. Step out. Step out. Put aside your flesh. Put aside your I'm too busy. And let's, let's get involved in the body of Christ. We're all parts. We need to step into the gifting that God has given to us, into our place of power. Um, if you've been struggling with, like, coming to church, man, it's the best thing in the world to do. It was for me. You know, it made me come to church. And guess what? I grew. I got spiritual. I got, I got grown up spiritually. Plus, I had guys, people calling me all the time saying, you need to be in church, although I didn't miss. Um, it can do, it can give you strength. It can give you power. It can give you confidence in God, which we need sometimes when we pray. We need confidence in God. Sometimes we ask God so much, but we don't feel like we're doing anything for him with our time, talent, or treasury. So then in in the back of our minds, we think, well, why should God even answer me? Because I've not done anything for him. Even though you don't ever have to do anything for him, he loves you. But it's us that think that, our flesh. It's not God saying that, it's us. And you know what? Sometimes just doing something, stepping out in a step of faith. I'm not recruiting tonight. I'm just trying to challenge you with where you are. This is a Wednesday night crowd. It's different than Sunday. Some people are the same, some different. But I just want to challenge you with where you are in your walk with Christ. Is it time for you to take the next step? All right? Let's bow our heads for a moment. We're going to pray. And, um, Father, I thank you, Lord, that um, as I've talked tonight about my personal experience and what I've seen in your word, I ask you, God, just to help us as a church to understand our part in doing your work. Understand our part in what you've given to us as giftings. Help us to understand our part in getting prayers answered. God, I just ask that each person that's here tonight will just think about what we've talked about. Think about the scripture. Think about the word that's gone forth. And and I know, Father, that as they mull over that, that that word, that you will perform what you want to with that word that has been preached. And I ask you, God, just to give us all a blessed evening tonight. Help us to um, get done what we need to get done for tomorrow and let us have a tremendous rest of the week as we get ready for Sunday services. And I thank you, Lord God, for each person here in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Two things real quick. Um, One is there are, in case you're feeling convicted or lovingly urged to, (laughs) to go to the connection desk, we do have volunteer applications that you can fill out. We can help you find where you need to fit. We really can. We're not going to quit until you feel like you're really doing what you need to do. The other thing is, is the women's conference has been reduced. Um, it's $25 because we want every woman there. We want everybody there that can be there. It's a Friday night and Saturday morning, so you don't even really have to take off work if you work Monday through Friday. It's going to be an awesome time. We're super excited about it. Lots of surprises. Okay, so y'all have a blessed night. Love y'all very much.